Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and students, on behalf of the Institute for Contemporary Arts and Media at the Department of Art History of the Catholic Private University Linz, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the lecture of Dr. Jennifer Walklade from the University of Aberdeen. It is the kickoff for our Global Art History Lecture Series, which is offered every two years by the Department of Art History as part of the teaching program. This winter term, Maximilian Lena and I have taken on the task of conceiving and organizing this event. We have decided to focus on the practice of curating in a globalized world, because this aspect offers an appealing overlap between theory and practice, especially for the students. But also because Maximilian Lena himself has been working internationally as a curator for many years now, and thus knows the economic, social, political, and artistic entanglements firsthand, which we would now like to critically reflect on together. Before I now briefly introduce our first guest speaker, I would like to express my sincere thanks to our student assistant, Angelika Pieber, who provides us with intensive support, as well as to the entire team at the university and the Günther Romwald Private Foundation for its important sponsorship. Moreover, I would like to point out that this lecture series is part of our new project called Wir stellen aus, which means we exhibit, that is a transdisciplinary collaborative project focused on sustainable, DIY, inclusive and participatory forms of curating and knowledge production, especially designed as a learning tool for students. You will find more information on, um, <clears throat> on Wir stellen aus on our website, and you are very welcome to join us in this task. So this being said, we can now give all our attention to our guest, Jennifer Walklade, who is a member of the Department of Anthropology uh, at Aberdeen University, and who provides today's entry into the general theme. She completed her PhD at the School of Museum Studies in Leicester in 2013 and accomplished a MA in 2009. She is not only highly specialized in the theoretical side of the field, but has also extensive first-hand knowledge from her experiences as collection assessor and volunteer with the galleries of the Justice Museum, the Ashmolean Museum, and the Royal Shakespeare Company collections. Jennifer Walklet is furthermore member of the Museum Ethnographers Group, the International Committee for Museums and Collections of Ethnography, and works as editor for Museum and Society and for the Best in Heritage Projects Influence Award. Today, she will speak about museums, anxieties, and radical temporality, the latter topic connected also to Maximilian's PhD project. And if I understood it right, you two met at a conference. And with this, I would like to give the word to Maximilian. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and, uh, and thank you also to, to Jen directly uh, for coming here and uh, joining us virtually. Um, we indeed met uh, due to our common interest in temporalities at the Temporal Belongings Conference in March, uh, which was devoted to the topic of uh, the material life of time. And I was really excited about uh, um, you. <laughs> being into, into the topic from a completely different side and dealing with it from the museum perspective, which helped me a lot. Um, so I also recommend to all of you uh, reading the texts by Jennifer Walklid, which are really um, like uh, from a theoretical perspective, very um, fruitful to deal with the um, museum perspective. And um, for me, this was uh, actually a perfect introduction also to the global entanglements because the temporal entanglements 
oftentimes refer to um, what we will deal with in this semester. So I'm very happy and looking forward to your talk and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, hopefully you can all hear me okay and you can all see the slides. If anything technical does go awry uh, during this, please just pop your hand up or put a note in the chat and, and, and let me know. So I'm Jen um, and it's really, really good to, to meet you all. And despite the fact that this is happening online, I'm still really happy to, to be here. I, I had hoped to be with you in person, but the UK is currently experiencing a rise in coronavirus cases. And I think you would rather have me visit you virtually than uh, infect you with our plague island uh, diseases. Regardless, I hope you're having a good term so far, and I hope you're really looking forward to these curating the post-global lectures. Um, I know I'll be really interested to see the uh, timetable that you've got planned. I thought it would be helpful uh, just before uh, we begin the main lecture to just give myself a little bit more of an introduction, um, although everything that was just said was was correct if, if very nice. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I'm a lecturer and curatorial fellow in museum studies. I work at the University of Aberdeen's Department of Anthropology. Um, that puts me in a slightly odd position um, because I'm not actually an anthropologist. Um, I'm not trained as an anthropologist. Uh, my original academic training is actually in medieval history believe it or not. Um, and whilst I was undertaking that study, I specialised in things like the mystery cycles, uh, the history of science and technology, and believe it or not, did an entire semester's worth of work on medieval sheep and shepherding. So I, I had a kind of eclectic background, but by the time I graduated from that series of study, I realised that the jobs available to me were relatively limited to teaching medieval history or becoming a spy. That's a true story, by the way. Um, the Secret Service in the UK, at least, like the language and research skills that typically come with uh, historians' backgrounds. But I decided that I wanted a, a more engaged and more practical job. And in any case, I don't think I would have made a very good spy so I moved into the museum world and I did that really through docenting initially at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. The Shakespeare Birthplace Trust looks after the properties that are associated with William Shakespeare and his immediate family. Uh, and I also worked at the RSC documenting their theatrical collections. And that was a really wonderful uh, experience. It was a really unique opportunity to engage with a really extensive and old and varied theatre collection. And after that, I completed my MA and PhD at Leicester, as was said. And I also taught there um, before moving up here to Aberdeen. Ooh, hit my slides are not moving. My slides moving for you. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. Um, so at Aberdeen, um, and this is a picture of the chapel at King's College at Aberdeen, uh, and you can see uh, just in front there a, a tomb, that's the tomb of Bishop Elphinstone, it's an empty tomb by the way, but that's the, um, the designated site for the tomb of Bishop Elphinstone who founded the University of Aberdeen uh, circa 1495, so we're a very very old institution, um, with, a, with a long history, particularly here at uh, King's campus uh, 
which is where I'm located today. And here at Aberdeen, I teach primarily on the MLIT degree in museum studies, and I really look at the digital world, and I also look at museum careers. And I also supervise students conducting uh, master's dissertations and museum studies, PhDs. I wanted to tell you uh, a little bit about Aberdeen as well, and I thought this picture of uh, the RAM uh, was particularly pertinent given my previously stated research interest in sheep. Um, this is a picture of uh, a RAM from the Aberdeen Bestiary, which is one of our most well-known artefacts. Um, it's in our special collections and it was made in England circa 1200. It's a beautiful illuminated manuscript and you can see most of it online actually. So if you want to Google the Aberdeen bestiary, I would recommend that you do so. I will also pop a link to it in the bibliography that I'll send to you after this um, lecture. But my research really focuses on two main areas. Um, I look at histories and cultures of museum documentation, which is a project that I'm working on currently. But I also look at the analysis of museums through other media forms. Now, those are typically things like literature, drama, comic books, even. Um, and I started doing this as part of my project looking at temporality and time and how it manifested in the museum context. And it's that second uh, piece of research or, or sort of field of research really that forms the basis of what I'm going to talk about with you today. Um, and just so you have some idea of where I spend um, a good proportion of my time, this building here is the museum at Marshall College, which is the other college in Aberdeen. Um, and I work in the office that's just on the left of your screens there. Um, so just past the tower. It's a wonderful building to, to work in, but it is quite cold, as you can imagine. OK, so with that all being said, let us begin the lecture proper. I wanted to start this lecture by clearly identifying the key terms that, that I have under discussion today. And those terms are anxiety, temporality, hauntology, and radical temporality. Later in the lecture, I'm planning on connecting all of these to the idea of the museum, which for the purposes of this lecture, um, I will be using in a relatively generic way, but obviously all museums are different and varied uh, and, and unique. For the moment, though, I just want to define uh, these terms on their own. Let's begin with anxiety. Now, I want to clarify here that I'm not referring to the debilitating mental health condition which shouldn't be belittled by being used as an academic plaything or a metaphor. But I am talking about the non-pathological human emotion. And the term anxiety comes from, uh, like the German angst, from the ancient Greek word anki, which is found in words meaning to press tight, to strangle or to burden. It's characterized by a specific kind of dread um, and directed at the future, the unknown. This distinguishes it from fear, which is aimed at something which is known and present. Now, anxiety is also in being future oriented, directly connected to possibility and thus to desire. And I'm sure that you have all experienced anxiety in the attempt to pursue what you want from your life and both the possibility that your dream won't happen as well as the equally terrifying idea that it will. Kierkegaard, who is perhaps the, the father of modern uh, philosophy when it comes to anxiety, writes, in all peoples where the childlike is preserved as dreaming spirit, there is this anxiety. The profounder the anxiety, the profounder the people. 
Anxiety has the same meaning here as melancholy at a much later point where freedom, having passed through the imperfect forms of its history, will in the profoundest sense come to itself. Okay, now let's move on. What do I mean by temporality? I don't mean the time measured by your watches or phones, which I will refer to typically as clock time. Instead, I mean something closer to Heidegger's interpretation uh, of it as the horizon of the understanding of being and every interpretation of being. In other words, time as the central phenomena that characterizes existence or being and the experience of that being. Time or temporality can thus be both the medium that allows a conscious mind to perceive things through change, for example, but it is also a form of perception in its own right, and Kant called it the subjective condition of the possibility of perception of the world. So there are many subjective forms and layers to temporality existing alongside and within each other. And these stretch from the personal durée or experience of an individual to the landscape of their day, to the society in which they live and to the other people around them. Now for hauntology, and here I've just put a, a picture of something called a Pepper's ghost. Um, to, to illustrate the idea of hauntology. And you can ask me about how this works uh, if you want, but the Pepper's Ghost is, is one of my very favorite um, practical museum trickery devices and has been used in um, shows such as Phantasmagoria since at least the, the 16th century. But hauntology itself is a play on words, really, a portmanteau or combination of haunt and ontology. So we can really define hauntology simply as meaning the knowing of the ghost or how to know the ghost. The term was coined by Jacques Derrida in his book Spectres of Marx as a way to understand the influence that absent, lost or past things can have in the political world. It's been used not only in the critical theory and literary worlds through which Derrida's own spectre still looms, but into disciplines such as sociology, with Avery Gordon's ghostly matters, a very evocative use uh, through the lens of race, slavery and historical erasure. And I'd really recommend uh, Avery Gordon's book, if this is something that you're interested in. Finally, and quickly, because we'll talk about this um, as we go throughout the lecture and particularly at the end, I just want to give you a brief uh, precy of radical temporality. And this is a phrase that I've developed in my work on museums and time. The way I envisage it is as a form of, or perhaps uh, more accurately, a way of using time, which is less as an agent of the status quo, and which has the power to question authority, status and hegemony. And it's radical on two vectors, because it recognizes itself as multiple and disruptive, and because it can question both itself and the position of institutions such as the museum. And radical temporality is many things which we'll address later on in the lecture, but for the purposes of this moment right now, we can see it as both anxious and hauntological. So just to, to move on, I want to address firstly the idea that museums are fundamentally anxious spaces. And this might seem like a strange statement to make. How can an institution which cannot experience or express emotion be anxious? And how can something which is so profoundly part of an elite or elitist cultural system call itself anxious. I want to explore that. First of all, the museum is a human site 
molded by the desires and dreams and fears of those who create it. Museums are built by feeling flawed humans who have a desire to preserve things for the future. We might even argue that it is the people who are the institution. So the desire and the future orientation that is present in the very creation of a museum really speaks to a particular character. And this is the anxiety which has been considered by some philosophers to be the basic human condition. Susan Pierce, who I, I also uh, lovingly refer to as the queen of material culture um, and a well-known figure in uh, the UK museum studies sector, writes how the desire to collect suggests a desire to persist beyond the grave. And we might also see this desire in the creation of almost anything from a personal journal to a child. So museum institutions are born, at least in part, from a culture of anxiety. To a degree, we might suggest that they imply some kind of attempt to curb the anxiety that surrounds mortality. But perhaps that's for another lecture, another time. I want to give you an example of this preservationist desire. And it's one that I think is indicative of a darker consequence of the museum's angst. Has anyone heard of the term salvage anthropology? Know what salvage anthropology is? Well, salvage anthropology was a factor in the development of one of the UK's most famous anthropological collections. And here is a picture uh, of the Pitt Rivers Museum at the University of Oxford, uh, in, down in the south of the UK. General Augustus Lane Henry Fox Pitt Rivers, wonderful name, um, gave his name to this museum. Uh, and he also donated much of the early collections. And he was a proponent of something called social evolutionism. Social evolutionism is the idea that so-called primitive cultures would either evolve towards the apogee of human development or become extinct. And of course, the highest form of human development was, according to Pitt Rivers and others like him, white, European, and male. And the idea of salvage anthropology was born from social evolutionism. It was the idea that they wanted to preserve the material culture of these dying cultures before they became extinct. Almost a century and a half after it was founded in 1884, this anxiety still shapes the way the Pitt Rivers Museum is seen. And it also shapes a newer anxiety in the form of acknowledging and encountering their colonial past. And this is shaping their behavior in the present. They have a number of really exciting projects ongoing at the moment, such as labeling matters. Um, and they've also uh, fairly recently removed some of their most famous artifacts, the shrunken heads or tsansanas off display. Uh, for reconsideration and recontextualization, which is quite, um, quite an extreme move for the Pitt Rivers, uh, it has to be said, although um, not so extreme in the landscape of UK anthropological collections more broadly. I will again link some of these projects in the, the bibliography that I uh, send to you. I want to, to move on now to address the second question of eliteness and authority. And it is at least somewhat the case that museums are part of the cultural establishment and that they are figures of authority. But as is usually the case, the situation is a little more nuanced than that. Museums are not neutral spaces. And we've seen that very clearly in the UK and the US 
over the last few years with mo movements such as museums are not neutral and decolonize this place in the US and protests over big oil sponsorship of museums or the retention of certain statues in the UK. And I don't know if you've experienced similar in, in Linz, um, but I, I would like to know and I'd like to find out. At present, the UK museum landscape has a complex relationship with authority. They've been accused of promoting the agenda of a liberal metropolitan elite by a group of primarily conservative public school boys who currently hold political power. And this is all really an attempt to stoke the fires of a culture war that most people don't really want. The problem is that it's working. After a summer marked by coronavirus lockdown and protests surrounding, in particular, the statues of controversial historical figures, uh, in September last year, our then culture secretary, Oliver Dowden, sent a letter to the museum heritage and cultural bodies, which to all intents and purposes implied that they had to follow the government's line on how history should be told or risk losing funding. And you can find that letter at a link I'll share with you and tell me what you think. Um, the implication I feel is, is quite heavy. But whatever the intention, it caused concern and consternation even amongst members of the museum community in the UK. Many felt that their arm's length autonomous status was being threatened, that their expertise as practitioners and academics was being undermined as part of an attempt at political posturing. So museums like universities had become targets and battlegrounds and pawns in an increasing attempt to polarize the UK public. And this was facilitated through politicians, the press, television, and social media. So this means that politically at least, museums perhaps don't occupy so secure a position in the establishment as might be assumed. What does an institution do with such uncertainty? In his classic book, Museums in a Troubled World, Robert Jaynes describes two personas that museums can take on when confronted with such difficulties. These are performers and learners. Performers, Jane says, are unwilling to risk failure. And as a consequence, such institutions cannot really grow or change beyond their present circumstances. Learners, on the other hand, are willing to take risks and whilst this might sometimes spell catastrophe for them, at other times it will allow them to move beyond themselves, to develop, to grow, and perhaps to pioneer activities in certain areas. And I think you can see how anxiety is also implicated here, that performers submit to their anxieties whilst learners embrace them. So I hope that I've made clear in this part of the lecture, my argument for understanding the museum as inherently anxious. And that's great conceptually, but what does it really mean for museums practically and their role in the post global? That last example from the UK that I gave you ties into the position of museums in a potentially post-global scenario very clearly, with links to a turn towards nationalistic populism. Indeed, the UK might be considered a prime example of an attempted post-global culture, with the English Defence League, the UK Independence Party and Britain First fanning the flames of what has so far, unsurprisingly, turned out to be an absolute fiasco of a Brexit. The idea of the post-global sheds fascinating light on the intricacies of one recent controversy in the UK heritage community. I want to talk here about um, a set of incidents that relate to the National Trust. Uh, the image that you can see here is of Chirk Castle, which is a, a long-standing member of the, the National Trust properties. 
Um, and I spent a lot of time here as a child. My, my grandfather was a docent here at the castle. Um, and it's in Wales, just near the border with England in an area called the Marcher Lands. It was a, a Marcher Lord castle. But the National Trust in the UK uh, is a long standing charitable organisation which cares for buildings like Church Castle and landscapes of historical importance. Many of the properties that they care for formerly belonged to members of the aristocracy and the elite, and many were thus connected not only to the British Empire, but also to the slave trade. A project researching and making public these connections run by the Trust and other academics and researchers has been ongoing for a number of years, and this project is called Colonial Connections. However, when the project's interim report was released in September 2020, it caused a lot of controversy. There are some headlines uh, from that time here. Uh, you can see the, the difference in uh, the, the different uh, press sectors here in the UK uh, from the Guardian's uh, more left-leaning um, acknowledgement that the National Trust needed to move into a more aware and astute 21st century, right down to the, the Telegraph's uh, headline, the National Trust needs to drop its woke nonsense. Um, for those of you uh, not up on uh, UK press uh, terminology, the Telegraph is also colloquially known as the Tory graph, because it very much has a conservative um, base. So the discussion about this uh, report, which made very clear uh, some of the, these slavery and colonial connections of these big properties, including properties associated with Winston Churchill, for example. Um, it, this, this conversation still continues today. And this month, actually, the National Trust will be holding its AGM, its annual general meeting, and it will vote in six new members of its council. A number of those seats are being lobbied for by a group called Restore Trust, which bills itself as a forum where members and supporters can discuss their concerns about the future of the National Trust. And in particular, uh, these uh, concerns counter the Colonial Connections project and its interim report. They're very concerned about the perceived wokeness or the progressive nature of the work that the National Trust are trying to do. A colleague of mine was also involved in a project called Prejudice and Pride, which looked at uh, previously hidden LGBTQ plus histories at historic National Trust properties. And this caused similar consternation um, in, in similar communities. They've written a, a post in response to the Colonial Connections interim report. Um, I've read it, I, I deem it poorly phrased and misrepresentative, if I'm honest. It relies on anecdote and liberal sprinklings of various argumentative fallacies, um, but it's not on its own. It's not a unique perspective. A similar position was taken by a group of MPs who are called the, the Common Sense Group. Um, they're a particular cabal, if you like, within the Conservative Party who campaign for an idea of authentic conservatism and against wokeness, whatever that might mean. One of the authors of the Colonial Connections report was a, a former colleague of mine, a woman called Corinne Fowler. Uh, she recently published a book called Green Unpleasant Land, Creative Responses to Rural England's Colonial Connections. Uh, that was published in December 2020, and it generated such a level of uproar that Fowler received death threats on Twitter. It's quite extraordinary. And here I've, I've really given you a picture of a Britain that must appear to be in the midst of a collective breakdown really over the role of heritage and culture and to an extent that's true at least if you were to believe the the media hype 
But the day-to-day -day situation is rather more mundane, prosaic. Um, bugs and floods are honestly a more immediate problem for many institutions than, than whatever the, the right-wing media wants to say. But it can't be ignored as a problem. The actions and statements of our two most recent culture secretaries, including Oliver Dowden, who I mentioned before, the Common Sense Group, and our own Prime Minister, bespeak an attempt to wrest cultural control from a more socially progressive wing of society. Museums, art galleries, and other heritage and culture institutions will need to take a stance and if they do not, they will have blinded themselves to the direction in which the Tory ship is steering the UK. And I fear that that uh, direction is towards isolationism, cultural stultification, elitism, even white supremacy, and certainly cruelty. And we've seen that uh, very much during the pandemic. I want to think now about museums as temporal spaces. And we've seen that museums are anxious and we've seen some of the reasons why, but they are also temporal, fundamentally bound up in the performance, representation and experience of different forms of time. And temporality is a fundamental component of their anxiety or anxiety is a fundamental component of their temporality, whichever way around you, you, you want to think about it. So before considering radical temporality as a tool for the post global, let us quickly consider museum temporality more broadly. Traditional, if slightly oblique ways in which museums have been understood as temporal include the following. History, memory, othering, and death. I want to break these down just a little. First, history. It sounds fairly obvious, of course, to suggest that museums are sites for history and that history is temporal. These things are true. The anxieties detailed in the previous section are evidence of this, but there are two things that we need to be aware of. One, that museums are not keepers of a singular and static history, but storytellers of multiple angles and perspectives upon the events of the past. And two, that time and history are not the same. Whereas time is experience itself, history is a selective narrative of that experience. History can be used to shape time in particular ways than the typical quote is he who controls the present controls the past he who controls the present controls the future so clear hopefully so if we think about the ongoing conversations in the UK at least about museums statues the national crust we have some sense about the temporal kernel of these anxieties the importance that people attribute to the shaping and telling of experience and how vital it is to an individual or group that their experience, their selective temporal narrative, their history is recognized. But it's also crucial to remember that the recognition of one can be, but does not have to be seen as destructive to another. And this is where a lot of this concern comes from, I feel. But regardless, we need to understand that there is power in deciding what is said and who it is said by. And Pascal Gielan writes, history and heritage do not simply appear in the consciousness of museum visitors. What is perceived as relevant history or heritage is offered to the visitor as an artifact or as an event of some historical importance. The mediator decides what is worth inheriting, so to speak. Now, history is also very closely connected to memory. Like history, memory can be understood as a selective narrative of experience, but it's also rather different than history. Memory is usually more individual and distinctly more fragile and often 
unless like me, you are aware that you have a truly poor memory, and I really do, um, we nonetheless equate it with truth. We often say things like, that's not how I remember it. As a technology of preservation, the museum is also a technology of memory. It always has been, even before it really existed as a museum in the contemporary sense. Hus Bredekamp argues that the Wunderkammer was a way of remembering Edenic wisdom, so wisdom from before the fall of man. Paula Finland argues that the Renaissance proto-musea were powered by the very pursuit of memory, both individual and cultural. And in a book on the topic, Susan Crane writes, museums deliberately forge memories in physical form to prevent the natural erosion of memory, both personal and collective. This is the task of preservation, of creating a new form for knowledge whose purely mental existence is well known to be ephemeral, or as Rudy Koshar defines it, the spectrum of interventions in the physical integrity of movable or immovable objects considered to have historical value. Gaynor Kavanagh especially emphasizes the emotional and imaginative aspects of memory that museums can provoke. She calls museums dream spaces or provokers of imaginative abstract dreams or daydreams. And these are emotive and intense recollections of feeling and sensation. As far as Kavanagh is concerned, these dream spaces are anarchic and unpredictable. And this is evocative of Derrida's description of the spectre, the ghost, as mad and unlocalizable. Memory is emergent then, and often more than a little haunted for sure. And one of its most substantive spectres is nostalgia, that sweet and bitter longing for a particular thing, place, person, moment, which may never have really existed how we wish it had. Britain has a painful and often largely uncritical nostalgia for the Second World War, reveling throughout the pandemic and ongoing austerity in the notion of the Blitz spirit and cries of keep calm and carry on. Left to its own devices, such uncritical nostalgia can be dangerous and it can be instrumentalized to destructive ends. De Simone writes, Discourses of remembrance can be ideologically instrumentalized and exploited to ignore the complexities of an historical event. They can be dehistoricized and mythologized to view the world in simple terms of good and evil, victims and perpetrators. So museums in their nostalgic mode can create imagined communities, if you like, of nation, state and culture. And this nostalgia can pull people away from the present and the anxiety provoking future. Mark Fisher writes, the present broken, desolated is constantly erasing itself, leaving few traces. Things catch your attention for a while, but you do not remember them for very long. But the old memories persist intact, constantly commemorated. And here uh, it's worth reflecting on things like um, displays at the V&A, for example, about Pink Floyd, about David Bowie, about similar um, historic um, figures, the prevalence of reboots and retellings of stories that we've heard time and time again, the popularity during the pandemic of 20-year-old programmes like Friends, at least on UK Netflix. But there's another form of nostalgia, which is more critical and more analytical. Boyne calls it reflective nostalgia. And whilst it does accept the, the longing characteristic of the mood, it retains the capacity for analysis and an understanding of the complexities and ambiguities of memory. It understands nostalgia and the nostalgic longing, in other words, as fictional. 
So let us now turn to the two final ways in which museums have traditionally been seen as temporal. Those are othering and death. We'll begin with death uh, because I want to delve specifically into one particular understanding of the temporality of museums, which is profoundly about othering. And I wanted to leave that to the end of this section. Since the time of Quatremere de Quincey, museums have been associated with death. I contend that this has been done in two forms, that museums have been seen as both murderers and as cemeteries. Theodore Adorno once argued that the adjective museal applies a disruption, the severing of the connection between object and user or observer. The act of bringing something into a museum is often understood as one of conceptual violence, a sudden transition from an object in living use to one which is dead on display. In cases where the collection and acquisition of objects was marred by actual or physical violence, this can seem even more acute. If museums are murderers, then it is because they change the temporal tense of an object from present to past. They take it out of a living circumstance and put it into one which is non-living. But museums can also be seen perhaps more passively as cemeteries. Sherman argues that it was de Quincey who first designated them as mausolea, places of burial, places showing the bones of objects and cultures for people to gawk at. For some, such as the futurists, this condemned museums to a necessary oblivion. But then again, the futurists also hated libraries and feminism. So perhaps we should take what they said with a pinch of salt. The association between museums and death is strong then. And whilst I would argue that the confrontation with individual cultural and species level morality is actually a vital part of what museums do, this shouldn't be used to position them away from life, static and moribund, because death is a part of life too. Finally, in this section, I want to think about the idea of othering and how it pertains to a museum's temporality. And there are two main ways in which museums are associated with othering, by othering and by being othered themselves. In the first case, it's worth once again returning to anthropological museums. And anthropological museums have often been accused of exoticizing and dehumanizing other cultures. And this act of exoticization is a form of othering, which allows the culture to which the museum belongs to distinguish us from them. And this othering is often done temporally. And Johannes Fabian wrote a book called Time and the Other, in which he argued that the discipline of anthropology used time to trap its subject in something called the ethnographic present. And this is a way in which an anthropologist can fix a culture in a singular unchanging moment in a kind of forever now, which is not quite the past, but from which they are conceptually barred from progressing, at least as far as the observer is concerned. And this might be literally through the way in which they are described in written texts, the tents that are used around them, for example. And anthropological museums can also do this, detemporalizing in their displays and their explanatory texts. Sometimes they can do it unintentionally. And perhaps that's a topic for a whole other lecture, to be honest, because it really does deserve more time than I can give it here. But when you're in a museum, when you're in a gallery space, think about the tense in which something is spoken about. Think about how that makes it relate to you, to the present, to the now. What I wanted to, to close this section with today was an examination of one of the most common ways in which museums are both defined temporally and othered, and that is the heterotopia. Oh, that's a great deal. And there's a, the hydrotension pole of the pyramids. Oh my, there we go. What is the heterotopia? 
The term was used by Michel Foucault to describe real spaces that are outside of the everyday, somehow indefinably other. In being real but other, they upset commonplace notions of the real world. A mirror is a good example of this. It's real, but it's not real. It's a reflection. Other spaces might also be a good term for heterotopia. And indeed, of other spaces is the title of his most focused work on the topic. In this work, he describes their five characteristics. One, that they exist either as heterotopias of crisis or deviation in every society and culture. Two, that those societies and cultures define them and how they change. Three, that they bring together the apparently incompatible. Four, that they are linked to heterochromies or temporal slices. And five, that they are closed or only accessible by means of the possession of particular qualities. In the same work, he also designates museums as heterotopias of indefinitely accumulating time, increasingly pressured and probably quite dusty. Now, I can see why one might describe a museum as a heterotopia. They very visibly align with the final four, and perhaps the first, of Foucault's characteristics. The meaning and function of museums are continually modified as societies change, and as the concept moves and is transferred out of the European milieu across geography and culture. And they also juxtapose the remnants of cultures distant in time and space with each other. And this includes the visitor, it includes the curator as well. They also can go uh, some way to accounting for the contemporary diversity of museums, which retain their status as heterotopia, but, sorry, I misread something there. Museums are definitely associated with heterochronies, with moments when there is a break made with traditional time. And we've seen this in our discussion of them as cemeteries. Museums are also closed in a sense. One might cite the example of the Contemporary Art Museum, which can be impenetrable if you don't know the language, you don't have the cultural context to understand what's going on. It is a little bit more difficult to read the museums as places of crisis or deviation, I feel. And certainly if they are read as, as bastions of, of cultural hegemony. But if they are understood instead as places of abjection, as places in which the jigsawing mishmash of time and location make us reconsider the things we thought were ordinary and inalienable, then perhaps they are places of crisis and deviation after all. But regardless, I find the heterotopic designation of the museum troublesome. And for specifically temporal reasons, actually. I think that positioning the museum as a heterotopia by presenting them as over and beyond the everyday takes away their agency in the real world. And it takes away, crucially, their responsibility to that world. If museums are heterotopia, then the implication is that they don't have to deal with the everyday, with the real world and all its attendant complexities. And this leads them into what has been termed a form of psychotic withdrawal in which they ignore the world around them, focus only inwardly and thus become staid and obsolete. Foucault also described the heterotopia as an effectively enacted utopia. And what does utopia mean, of course? No place at all. This designation of museum time as deathly othering memorial, historical, heterotopic, and even just strange is unsatisfactory. To restrict museums to places where time is a little bit odd limits their capacity to do good in the world. So I want to engage with a new understanding of museum time, which might allow us to have some more agency over what they actually do. And that idea is radical time.
What are the features of museum temporality which allow it this radical potential? Now, my research has typically focused on uncovering and describing the temporal features and behaviours of museums through a method I call literary phenomenology. That is the combination of literary frameworks of analysis with phenomenological immersion in museum spaces. And if you want to learn more about what that looks like, uh, then you can view my thesis, which again will be in the bibliography, but I'm also turning it into a book and that's not intended as a plug at all, but it probably sounded like it. Let's look at some of those features then, particularly those relating to radical potential. Firstly, I like to think of museums as writerly, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. And this is both in terms of meaning, but also in terms of, of temporal experience. The idea of writerliness originates with Roland Barthes' book, SZ. And in this book, he describes the reader of a text and how they loosen the iron grip of an author over its meaning by understanding it from their own perspectives, their own subjective position. And this is akin to what is suggested in the, the Gielan quote I offered previously, I think. But I just wanna kind of add a little bit of complexity to that here. We need to really clarify that individual museum visitors are all temporal agents and they all work together and individually and with the museum in its objects and spaces to produce these fleeting, uh, unique times and spaces of meaning. So to understand museum visitors as Dasein, if you like, is key here. And I mean that Dasein in, in a Heideggerian sense, the, the, the idea of presence or existence of being there or their being. And this is a fundamentally human condition uh, that we must confront really at the paradox of our existence and our relationships to others. The key thing about Dasein for us here is that it's characterized not as having potential, but as being potential itself. Once we understand that all of the human interlocutors of museums, the staff, the makers, the visitors, the donors, as all being bundles of possibility, the, the, the interactions that are described by Gielan cease to be really simple or one-on-one -on -one transactional affairs. The imminent time that is encountered in these experiences becomes radical because it's more complex than we have historically as museum scholars allowed, and because it's utterly impossible to predict. And it's thus not entirely within the museum's control, which I think can be a rather disconcerting situation. These encounters are nexuses of possibility, if you like, and they can substantively shift experiences that individuals might have. Now I could tell you about the time I visited the back-to-back the -back houses in, in Birmingham, which is my home city here in the UK, with fellow museum specialists. We were walking upstairs um, into the attic space of one of these houses, which are, as the name suggests, kind of built back-to-back -back with each other in, in very small, cramped environments. Um, and they were particularly common in slum housing in the early part of the 20th century. The large proportion of my family were born and brought up in back-to-back in -back housing in Birmingham. So as I went up into the attic space in, in this house, I saw a coat hook on the back of the door. The rest of the attic was almost completely bare and all there was was this coat hook. But for some reason, it pulled me out of what I can only describe as my carefree entanglement with the everyday. And it made me care. It made me connect to something which was entirely outside my sense of chronological time. And I burst into tears. And I have no idea really why, apart from the fact that this coat hook was suddenly so meaningful, suddenly so singular. And I could go back there again today and I probably wouldn't have the same reaction. So these moments are kind of precious and unique and memorable. 
as a consequence. So the temporal features of museums aren't just produced by their sentient agents like myself, but also by their material and architectural features, their culture, their objects, their buildings. Museum objects are what we might call transchronic agents, that is, they're pulling different times and places together into a singular place, into a singular moment, the experience of the museum visitor. Geoepistemology is, is an idea that I use quite regularly. Um, and in geoepistemology, we're talking about the philosophy and understanding that's produced when a geographical location becomes the organizing perspective for the production framing of knowledge and subjectivity. And so we can suggest that there is something called a geochronic epistemology too, in which a temporal context works both within and parallel to this geographical organization. Museum objects spend, uh, upend really actually, any sense of a stable geochronic epistemology by their transchronic nature, by their capacity to bring spaces and times into places where they should not be. Mark Fisher, who I quoted earlier, also wrote of the idea of the eerie. And the eerie is something that, that might refer to either a thing which is where nothing should be or nothing where something should be. And this is the disruption that is caused by the museum object too. And some museum objects are particularly special. Some are ahistoric, undateable, unknown. Some are eccentrically temporal. And these might be digital copies of objects that are used in interactives, or they might be reproductions, photographs, replicas. These are particularly strange and haunted objects because they are not tied to a simple historical temporal narrative. Derrida might call these kind of objects mad and unlocalizable, if you like. And sometimes objects can be partial representatives of an elsewhere or an elsewhere. These are called synecdoches. They might also be wounded, broken, damaged, or reminders of the instability and entropy that exists even within the museum. Some objects are also evocative of absence. And I, I want to, to speak here for a second about the Oxford dodo. Um, the Oxford dodo is one of my favorite things in the world. Um, so if you'll forgive me for uh, discoursing a little bit on the Oxford dodo for the moment. Uh, this is a reconstruction of the Oxford Dodo, which is held at the um, Natural History Museum of Oxford University. Um, the museum also holds the most complete remains of a Dodo anywhere in the world. And that comprises simply uh, the mummified head and left foot. That's all that's left. Um, and this was a once complete Dodo that was originally brought to Britain by John Tradescant. The real artifacts, the real dodo, uh, what remains of him at least, are held in storage. What's on display in this case alongside this reconstruction are casts. And these casts, along with this reconstruction here, really distance us from those original artifacts and they distance us from the creature itself still further. And there's a real irony, actually, to the fact that <clears throat> the creature, which is so connected to extinction, so connected to loss, is really not there at all, not in the case at all, not on display. It kind of exhibits the passage of a void, as Bath would have said, or Sartori. There's also a greater strangeness in relation to the dodo, and it's one of the reasons that, that I like the dodo very much. The dodo as an image is really key to the identity of Oxford as a city and of this institution specifically. If any of you have read Alice in Wonderland, you'll recognize Lewis Carroll's dodo, uh, which was drawn originally by John Tenniel. And this dodo uh, drawn by Tenniel is appropriated as a symbol of the museum, as an iconic object. The Twitter account for the Natural History Museum 
is at more than a dodo, which I think is, is quite telling. The dodo appears on directional signs, on tea towels, and he's the ultimate non-present object, really. He's a visible absence, a visible lacuna. So museums then, with their people, objects, and spaces, they're not docile to time. They're hauntological, they're astray, they're out of step with themselves. They're filled with spectres, ghosts of times past, and the potential spectres of the present and the yet to come. Museum temporality in this context starts to become radical. And in using this phrase, I intend to position temporality, museum temporality here, uh, not as a, a slave to progressivist histories trapped in timelines and teleology, but as a political agent, which is capable of questioning preconceived notions of authority, status and power. Museum time has the capacity to be disruptive, to question the status quo, and because of this, it is radical. Museum time has the capacity to acknowledge the too much memory, the melancholy, the sadness of the museum. And in doing so, it allows a space for pain and for empathy. So the museum is not, as the heterotopia suggests, moribund. It is rightly layered, diverse, deferred, co-extant, porous, transchronic, sublime, entropic, pharmacotic, lacunaic, and hauntological. It is ultimately a space in which time is out of joint. What does this matter? Well, there are two main ways in which the idea of radical time allows us to engage in a political and ethical act, and perhaps allows us to move towards a new way of curating in the post-global, which considers a broader context, which considers feeling and empathy and loss and memory in critical ways. These two ways are by forcing a decentering of Western and Eurocentric approaches towards history and memory, and by showing the museum itself to be something that I call a, a filigree god that requires dismantling and reconfiguration. The radically temporal museum undermines the simplistic notion that time as perceived in Western culture at least is linear because it's porous, it's multiple, it's self-aware. In the radically temporal museum, time is social and experiential, it's multiple and varied. Radical temporality isn't eschatological, it doesn't demand meaningfulness as its end, it's quite happy to exist. In so doing, it takes away fate and replaces it instead with agency and with responsibility. It encourages the acknowledgement of gaps, of elisions, and it revels in this incompleteness. It allows more voices to join its chorus in so doing. It disavows the primacy of canon, if you like, and it forces heritage institutions that are promoting particular kinds of nostalgia and the historical existence of certain imagined communities to reconsider their status and their stances. It's able to acknowledge multiple other perceptions of time and open up new perspectives on the nature of objects. And I, as a, a white British woman, don't really want to make a claim as to what those different forms of time might be. But I do think that it's crucial that we present the possibility of that understanding. And I do hope to help open up the space and time of those institutions to other understandings of temporality, which might change how the museum itself is shaped in the future. Through this, hopefully, implicitly imperialist, colonialist and exclusionary implications, which, which do hide in the museum presentation of time, might be removed. And an obvious example of this might be approaches made towards otherness, towards the ethnographic present, as we discussed earlier. <laughs>
And the second perspective, um, the showing museum itself to be a, a filigree god to be reconfigured. I think we need to think about it as um, something that can allow us to disrupt this sort of sense of the museum that's presented as permanent and authoritative. By understanding the way in which museums manipulate and are manipulated by time, we can remove their dependency on this idea of permanence and authority and build instead institutions that are surrounded by openness, polyvocality and empathy. In removing this dependency on permanence, museums accept not simply the mortality of their objects and the mortality of their staff, but the mortality of themselves. It allows them to recognize that maybe one day a time will come when they're no longer vital and important institutions. The exploration of museum time shows that there are multiple agents involved in producing a museum and that their meanings many of which are unknown and possibly unknowable. Authority in both interpretation and meaning then is really not solely the preserve of the institution. The visitor, their body, their mind, their cognition becomes a powerful contributor towards meaning. And in this power is redistributed and the purposes of the varied elements holding the museum and building the museum as an institution are reconfigured, are put back together. So rather than the survival of the institution then, focus shifts towards the survival of purpose, of demonstrating and preserving culture in all its infinite diversity and infinite combinations. I hope that you've enjoyed this lecture. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. This was such a pleasure. It was an amazing talk. It was so rich. And I have to say, it gives me really back the hope for the museum of the future. <laughs> because last week I read with my students a text on the tiredness of this institution. And you showed now, I think, uh, beautifully very thought-provoking way, the potentiality of this old institution, which we might uh, often struggle with. So I'm very happy to open the floor for questions. And um, if somebody has problem with the English, we are also happy to help with translation. And also... Uh now you can you can unmute yourself again uh, by yourself so you can just jump in to have questions um hello my name is quaid i have kind of kind of more of a uh, an expansion rather than a question um i like when you talked about the difference between performers and uh learners within the museum systems and i was just wondering um what are some some uh some more examples of perhaps uh learners versus performers within the museum systems and how do we push more museums to that 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 uh that learning phase rather than performing letting that anxiety take over that you that you discussed so fruitfully in the beginning of your lecture that's a really interesting question quite thank you um i think that i would be inclined from a from a personal perspective and, and knowing what they do to consider the contemporary Pitt Rivers as much more of a learning institution. Um, I think those two designations are very useful. Uh, I think they are also not necessarily um, sort of, oh, how would I phrase this? Um, I don't think that they're necessarily completely the case with any institution at any one time you know as we said institutions are as much as anything the people that are working there and for example the pit rivers has changed markedly over the last 50 odd years uh, and their contemporary uh, director laura van brockhaven is uh, 
um, an incredibly dynamic woman and incredibly focused on a much more radical practice um, than perhaps the, the Pitt Rivers has historically been, even in, in their, their fairly um, uh, aware and uh, considerate approaches over the last 20 years. Um, I think there are lots of ways in which we can act as practitioners to help our institutions become more aware of themselves, more aware of their contexts, and more aware of the fact that not only do they have responsibilities to their objects, they have responsibilities to society as well. And I think that's a really mm -hmm. crucial thing. I think it can be very easy to think that, um, you know, visitors exist for us, right? Visitors have a responsibility to come and visit us. But actually, uh, museums, art galleries, heritage sites, what you will, have a responsibility to their communities, whoever those communities are. And I think reminding them of that, reminding them of the importance of, of responsibility um, rather than um, rather than entitlement, I think, is, is, is the most crucial thing. No one's entitled to anything, but everybody's responsible for something. And that is also true of institutions. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yes, ma'am, thank you. Thanks, Quaid. Um, I wanted to talk about something. Uh, the um, example that you gave of the dodo mm -hmm. um, reminded me of, um, I read like an article recently about the Lascaux cave paintings which were yes. these paintings that were found in France by some college students in the 40s, I think, and uh, were then made public to the public. And um, it's funny because the more people went into those caves, the more the paintings got ruined. And so that also very much talks about the visitor being a temporal agent because the, the paintings were so ruined that they closed the cave off to the public and made this whole other um, cave that looks exactly like it and that you can visit now, but the original cave you can't visit anymore because too many people have seen it and thus also destroyed by oxidation also the paintings. Yeah. So that's also interesting, I think, if you think about the temporal um, sense of, of, of museums as well and paintings and original things, yeah. That's a really lovely example, Laura, actually. I really appreciate that. Um, it, it, I, I always think about the um, the pyramids at Giza as well, which were closed, you can't go inside them anymore. Um, there are similar conversations uh, in the UK about Stonehenge, yeah, um, exactly. you know, a primary prehistoric site about, you know, who gets to use them and who gets to, you know, inhabit these spaces. And I think... There's something really interesting about that, and I don't necessarily want at, at this point to, to come down on one side or the other, you know, and to say it's absolutely right that these places should be closed off and protected and no one should ever see them, because on the one hand, you know, if you can't see them, they might as well not be there, you know, yeah. there's, there's, a, there's a strange kind of... Um, and also by seeing um, the, the paintings that are not actual the real paintings, yeah. the visitor in the museum also basically, I think you mentioned it beforehand, is seeing something that doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah. And it's, it very much breaks like the reality of, of, of going to a museum to experience time and memory. If you see something that you know isn't real. Yeah, yeah. really, really interesting. I, I, I love that point. And you know, the, the dodo, I love the dodo very specific. I, I like casts, right? I like um, remediations. Um, so casts are really interesting. The Ashmolean has um, a cast gallery, um, a really, really well-known cast gallery that was, that was created for art students, essentially, to be able to see um, classical sculpture that they wouldn't otherwise be able to see. Um, and you know these are on display as casts. They're on display as as inauthentic things. But as soon as you talked, I had a, there was a PhD student at Leicester who was looking at the cast gallery, and she was telling me that whenever 
um, she would tell someone, you know, these aren't the real classical statues, don't you? They would just be horrified. Yeah. Well, of course they're not. <laughs> right? Do you think we've got all these things from Greece? Um, really, really interesting, really fascinating kind of response that people have to that idea of the authentic. And mm -hmm. the question of whether or not that matters um, is something that I think is going to be increasingly important as we're moving into a context where more and more of our objects are immaterial. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about, you know, digital artifacts, for example, digital art, how do you curate that? How do you preserve, um, you know, cultural artifacts from the early 21st century, like apps? <laughs> um, there's a, a wonderful project, um, a wonderful example rather than a project, uh, from the Cooper Hewitt uh, Museum at the Smithsonian. Um, and they were the first museum in the world to collect an app. And that was all the way back in 2013, actually. Um, they collected an app called Planetary. And it wasn't the you know, skin of the app that they collected. It wasn't an iPad or, or an iPhone. It was the code for the app. Mm -hmm. But the only way that, and they, they collected this on a um, on a, a, a Git repository. I, I don't know how many of you are, are kind of into um, computing speak, but, but GitHub is a, a repository basically where people can put code and documentation about code and change it and update it and modify it and keep, keep versions basically. It's like a version control um, platform. Um, and so they, they collected it on GitHub. Um, this meant that it was also available to the community to, to make their own versions of, to, to copy and modify. But the only way it's really accessible to one of the museum visitors is through two first generation iPads in the gallery. Um, these first generation iPads are, you know, more than a decade old at this point. And at some point they're going to stop working. Um, newer iPads do not have backwards compatibility with planetary. So as soon as those iPads stop working, they will not be able to show planetary in that form. So what does that mean? You know, do they do an emulation? Do they do a new version of the, the app that works on another device? How are they going to preserve this thing that they've collected, which is actually so ephemeral, but so kind of characteristic of the early 21st century. Um, we're going to have so many conversations about the preservation of, of really fragile things, I think. Yeah, thank you for, for your uh, answer. This was very broad. I think maybe um, what Nora uh, said, what first came to my mind is not only the fragility of these kind of objects, but the ide ideology of fake, right? And I think that's super, super important uh, what you stressed in the end of your paper, uh, of your talk, this uh, responsibility. Because what I saw lately more often than before, maybe, is uh, like fake e exhibition of fake artifacts or fake uh, whatever. Yeah. And I think this can become really dangerous because it's maybe anno annoying us in a political sense, uh, you know, when they stress like identity and nation and so forth. But um, I have to think about, I don't know, climate change, uh, migration, uh, healthcare, and many other problems that we are facing that, you know, uh, they, it's kind of a model, the museum, they can like really experience this kind of exhibition modes uh, to tell really weird stories in a way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the issue of climate change is something that's on my mind at the moment. I'm developing a course on 
um, museums and sustainable futures for our on-demand program. Um, and it's a, a hot topic in, in the UK at the moment, um, particularly surrounding the Science Museum, which for some mm -hmm. reason keeps choosing oil companies to be its sponsor for climate change activisms, <laughs> um, which is just inexplicable to me. <laughs> um, so, you know, th these are things that, that this, this political nature, yeah. that whether or not museums want to be political, the fact that they are political is absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it's, re it's really important for us to, dist to, to be nuanced when we're talking about that politics. And the thing that I always try and get across to my students is that when we're talking about the museum as a political agent, we're not talking about party politics. So we're not saying that they're associated yeah, yeah. with the Conservatives or the Liberals or, or the Democratic Party or wh whatever it is that we, we're associating them with. Um, we're talking about the fact that they have agency in the social world, right? We're talking about the fact that they have the capacity to make change. That is what it means for them to be a political agent, not that they should be necessarily tied to a particular government or party. Um, and I think that sometimes conversation, certainly in the UK, where we're not really known for being all that subtle about these things, gets really um muddy actually yeah. it gets it gets really really muddy and i think we confuse those things and that's what's happened in the uk you know the the, the government has often uh, sort of said that you know we are as museums part of the, the the sort of cultural arm you know and and that way that way lies some really scary things i think um, which is absolutely why museums have to take a stance on these kind of issues, regardless of whether or not they want to be involved in, in some kind of putative culture war. As I said, that no one wants, really. Yeah. <laughs> Walk down the street, nobody is really talking about that. But there it is. We now have to take a stance on these particular things. And if we don't, you know, we're just letting people get away with horrific things in lots of cases yeah definitely so before i go on with my talking <laughs> with you the whole evening um are there any further questions or remarks some ideas that you would like to share If, if not, I, I would jump in. Okay. <laughs> but I, I never, had, maybe, maybe it goes too far, but I would really be interested in a certain shift of perspective that uh, was underlying in your talk, uh, mm -hmm. be, because your, your literary, literary phenomenology is talking about uh, uh, the, the, like the subjective agency in a temporal sense um, that museum visitors take up. But at the other hand, as soon as you as you talk about the radical temporality that the museum inhabits, um, th this is uh, like conceived from a different perspective as I as as I saw it. So I would be interested in uh, because on the one hand uh, you you position the visitor, um, and this is also crucial to me in in thinking about temporality. The, the, on the one hand, you position the, the visitor as being the temporal agent who conceives their own um, temporal narrative within the, the exhibition. And on mm -hmm. the other hand, there is the radical temporality of the museum, um, wh where the museum actually um, takes the responsibility, while in the first place, uh, the the visitor has its uh, has their their autonomy so, so i i wanted to 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 maybe ask back uh, how this shift happened and how you you thought about it that's a really good question actually and i i appreciate it it may be more to do with i think me not explaining myself <laughs> as clearly as i might have done <laughs> um but really what i'm talking about is um 
is a relational um, mutual creation of this kind of radical temporality. So um, what I want to emphasize in conversations about museum time is the fact that it is not only the museum as an institution, as a building, as an exhibition space, um, as a group of people which has agency over what that experience is, but also that the visitor is um, you know, constitutively bound up in that and that their experience is a product of both their own radically temporal nature and that of the museum. Um, and I think that the key thing about arguing for museums as places of radical time is to, um, like with the, the conversation about the visitor, empower them to understand that they are more than singular, that they are not just monolithic, right, and that they can... Um, that they have the capacity and that they have the agency along with the visitor to enact time and to behave temporally in ways which are much more um, progressive and engaged and, and for which they are responsible. So it's, it's about kind of highlighting both of those sets of individuals. But yeah, thank you for Thank you for helping me clarify that. I appreciate yeah, th it. Th thanks for the clarification. This really, really helped. And this also makes the, the analysis a, a kind of tool for how to how to conceive a radical temporality in, for, from the other side as well. Like, thank you. Thank you, Maximilian. <clears throat> so, other questions? No. I can't see anybody raising hands or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hello. Maybe hello. Just, maybe just to remark that um, uh, museums were always somehow a sacred space. Uh, it, it was given to people like it, it's a sacred space. And now, after reading the paper and uh, after listening to you, I have uh, the feeling that. Um, it's just a social um, place and political place uh, that is art centered and nothing like a sacred, maybe. That's a really <laughs> important point. I think Lina, it's, um, I think they, they can be a variety of things, you know, depending on the person going into them, uh, depending on the day, depending on- Laura. You know a whole variety of factors yes absolutely and often museums do position themselves and their objects as these kind of sacred things so i, I refer to in, a, in, a, in another text the way in which museums use lighting to create a particularly um erratic or atmospheric quality surrounding one particular um hero object if you like um or star object and that certainly um, kind of connotes a status of something sacred as, as a sort of temple-like space. The other term that I often use in my work on museum time is chronotope. And the idea of the chronotope mm. comes from, have I got the book? I haven't got the book, it's at home. Um, <laughs> comes from Mikhail Bakhtin, who's a Russian um, writer uh, of the early 20th century, and he talks about chronotopes in literature as specific um, entanglements of sort of genre features, narrative constructions, um, and particular kinds of tropes. And that also, I think, is the case in, in museum spaces, and you can go into a variety of different museum spaces and think, OK, well, this is a very, um, you know, child, it's a children's museum, for example, a very social, educationally focused, loud, noisy um, space, and this is its own kind of, of chronotope, if you like. It's a very different space than a classical art gallery. Okay. And, and the Ashmolean, actually, if you ever go to the Ashmolean, um, it's 
it feels like two museums that have been pasted together. Um, on the one side is the new extent, and it's not that new anymore, but it was opened in 2009. Um, and it's very neoclassical, uh, full of marble, quite loud, quite dramatic displays, um, quite echoey. Um, you can hear people all over the place, um, Portland stone and marble. So everything's quite loud. It sounds a bit like a swimming pool, if I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a, a set of sliding doors um, near the, the back of those, the back of those galleries, actually, as you move, move away from the lobby. Um, and that takes you into the, the, the old Taylorian art galleries. And these are the most classically art gallery, art galleries you can possibly imagine. They have gold frames, they have um, red and green, sort of flocked plush wallpaper, soft seating. And as soon as you move from the, the new extension to the Taylorian wing, all the sound is muffled. It becomes silent. It's, it's very strange and people start behaving differently mm -hmm. in that space. They start whispering. Mm -hmm. They were talking normally um, in, in the Mather extension, but they're whispering in the art galleries. It's the same museum, but that, that chronotopic environment has created a total change really in how they behave. And you can see that as well in, in, in the Pitt Rivers and in um, the Natural History Museum, which are also attached to each other. Um, and again, if you, if you ever go to Oxford, you'll, you'll see that. Um, you know, the, the, the Natural History Museum is an open space, relatively speaking, lots of exciting displays that you can touch and, and go into. Children really love it. There's dinosaurs everywhere. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a wonderful place. And then the Pitt Rivers, as you will have seen, is comparatively dark, very cluttered, full of wooden cases and objects. And it is itself a wonderful space. But, you know, most people who walk in there immediately get a headache because um, <laughs> it's just so full. Um, but I think this this kind of idea that that museums can be multiple different things even within their own galleries and they can have these kind of chronotopic identities whilst also being um, more radically temporal as a whole is a really kind of fascinating feature that they have so I think they can be sacred spaces I think they can be very contemplative um, sort of temple-like spaces but they're not just that and they don't have to be just that they can be so much more mm. Yeah, you, I would just quickly like uh, to add that I particularly liked your idea of museums being not heterotopias. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the heterotopia just, makes me angry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, this would be another discussion, but I just wanted to make this mark before we leave. And the other thing, the other idea that I would like to share was the uh, when you um, mentioned that in that uh, museum you saw the coat hook and mm. that moved you so much. Yeah? And this um, reminded me of Roland Barth uh, Punctum. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, there he is talking about photography, but we can also think about museum as an image, right? Or a construction or something. Uh, and then this would, again, I think, come in really nice as, uh, as idea in your rich framework. Thank you. I completely agree. Um, I, I think that's, that's absolutely um, sort of correct uh response to that that experience um and i think we've all had those kind of experiences and often they're spoken about yeah. in a museum context in terms of like resonance wonder and similar things but i think there's, some, there's something more complex mm -hmm. going on there that there are more complex responses that we're having i think so thank yeah. you thank you no no China. As, did you mean um, as in the punctum, as in you walk into a museum, 
and you find something specific to yourself that catches your eye and, yeah. and that's specific to yourself and to yourself only. Yeah, and um, it's not specific, it's even more, you know, it's moving you to a deep emotion. Uh, and this ties back, I think, to the to the idea of the visitor also as agent and about this complex relationship that that you're in within this museum. But I also think sometimes I see people walk through a museum and the punctum is completely lost. Like they walk through yeah. the room and, and it's just all like whatever our work the curator put into the exhibition, it, it doesn't even arrive. Yeah. Maybe the, the punctum ends up being the coffee shop outside where they sell a <laughs> shop or something, you know? So I don't know, it, it is, it's difficult because the punct, like curating only is ever really makes sense if you, uh, if other people understand. But sometimes people visit the museum because I don't know, their mom told them to, or not because they want to be there or because they're culturally interested. Yeah. or maybe on a field trip you know there are a lot of people who mm -hmm. go to the museum and i feel like they don't even touch or or think about things so it, i think the punctum is also specific to what cultural background you have and what you expect out of the visit in the museum yeah yeah well, I, I would absolutely agree with that and i i actually think that's okay in a lot of ways yeah. We can only curate what we can curate, right? We can only create and present the things that we present and the things that we find that that move us. And I'm sure the person who decided to, to leave that coat hook on the back of the door had no idea that, you know, some, some PhD student would go into that attic space and burst into tears. I'm pretty sure that wasn't part of their plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, they were probably expecting me to just walk straight through. And I think that's, that's fine. We need to give people the agency to engage or not engage in that way as well. Right? Yeah. Well, but I think this is a super interesting point also, um, because actually our lecture series deals with curating. So this is kind of a task for future curators to allow, to make this situation possible, to think about such environments where such a thing is possible. Because what you mentioned before, I saw it oftentimes, you know, this uh, being the crowd being overwhelmed by a mass of objects and information, and maybe they're the secret for, for good curating best practice is maybe also to reduce information, mm -hmm. you know, to that, that you are, that, that is possible just to see a code hook. Yeah. So. Your answers. Any closing remarks? Maximilian? No, no, I thought of this as a very good closing remark, uh, actually, <laughs> because it, it made me think again of, uh, of how, to, how to create this, uh, these kind of entry points uh, to, to find such a, such a place where, where you can focus and then uh, find your way, like your own way through an exhibition. And I think uh, th this was quite well uh, summed up by, by these points, so. So wonderful. Now this is a moment where I have to thank, first of all, uh, Jennifer Walklet for this amazing talk. This was such a good kickoff event for our lecture series. Really amazing. And uh, yeah, usually now we would go for a beer and Austrian food. You miss that. But hopefully in future you will join us or we will experience uh, Oxford one day, maybe, or Aberdeen, <laughs> hopefully. Also Aberdeen, I'll give you whiskey and haggis. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah, we have the, the Knödel here and the Linzer Torte and this kind of things. They're also really nice. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Thank our students uh, for, for attending. Um, thank you.
Jennifer again and Angelica and Maximilian, of course, for organizing and the support. And next week we take a break and then uh, we meet each other again in Zoom uh, in two weeks time. Thank you.